And I am pleased to be here, and I'm actually going to be reporting on a project that uh, the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs has been focusing on for the last couple of years. Uh, and the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs is an endowed institute by the U.S. Congress in honor of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was kind of a scholar statesman, uh, whom I think we miss now in the American Congress. Uh, but one of his interests was in uh, thinking ahead, looking for problems that were down the road, and then because he was interested in both data and research, thinking about what the data and research we had now actually said about the problem, uh, and then taking a further step and saying, okay, what's a public policy that we could put into effect right now that might get us some traction in the future. And so in taking over the Moynihan Institute, um, we have really begun to focus on non-state actors because we don't think there is enough attention paid to them and that they are having more and more impact uh, in the world on what is happening. So what I'm going to do today is talk about our Mapping Global Insecurity pro Program or project and it really is looking at a new kind of actor. And we got started in thinking about this when Melvin Levitsky, who was a faculty member here at the Maxwell School, who had been an ambassador, he had served in a number of uh, important positions in the State Department, but his position at the time that he was here was as the U.S. representative to the U.N. Uh, Office of Drugs and Crime. And he came back after just about every session repeating this statement over and over again. It is a dream come true for criminals and terrorists to find a place where no one can look for them, where they can mix with, ally with, and work with minimum interference from legal authority, rapid globalization and the spread of modern information and communication technologies allow outlaw groups and individuals to do their business from these isolated areas. And so what our project is doing is trying to focus on these safe havens as defined by insurgent terrorist and transnational criminal organizations and we're particularly interested in the areas that are governed by these organizations that are outside effective state-based government control and are sustained by illicit economic activities. That's kind of our definition. It's a growing interest among a lot in law enforcement around the world in thinking about, some people have called them dark corners, some people have called them geopolitical black holes. We have kind of given them the name black spots because we think that they parallel the notion of black holes in astronomy which defy Newtonian physics and in effect these black spots are defying the Westphalian state system because they are actually uh, engaged in sovereignty, they have borders, they have defined a territory or a space that they are governing. And what we're trying to do in this project is really to map the world through the eyes of insurgent terrorist and criminal organizations to try to think about what are the flows, what are the interconnected networks, how does the illicit global economy actually work, and are we really coming into a new era where we've often thought of globalization as making us more a global kind of governance system, and we're saying, no, 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 maybe at the same time, it's actually fragmenting the uh, state system, and we're creating the new pirate islands of the 17th and 18th century, the city-states, the feudal kingdoms, that it's a fragmentation into smaller sovereign units as opposed to a movement to the larger uh, set of units. Some examples of those that we have looked at, we've identified 150 around the world 
we've actually now have uh, fairly detailed case studies of 80 of these. Uh, so the one that many of us in the United States learned about very quickly during the war in Afghanistan is the federally administered uh, FATA or the federally administered tribal areas, which are right around the Khyber Pass. And they really are not effectively governed by Pakistan. In fact, Pakistan often has to send troops in order to see if they can increase their governance. And it becomes a black market for drugs, for people, for weapons. You can get just about anything in that area. Uh, so it becomes governed actually by a coordinated kind of set of transnational criminal organizations and drug uh, cartels. Suedad del Esta, and I'm going to talk about that a little later on, is the tribord area uh, between Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil. Uh, the Wa State, Myanmar, Becca Valley in Lebanon, uh, the Pankisi Gorge in Georgia. Uh, there's a uranium mine, actually, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So they're varied in their geographic kind of structure and uh, locale. Um, most of them, 89% of them are 80 that I'm going to be talking about here, are located on international borders. And this is the impact of globalization. In effect, it's facilitated the movement back and forth, the ease of movement back and forth across the borders so that you can, these groups can actually move from one legal jurisdiction to another, and it in effect makes it easier for them to engage in their uh, illicit activities. 88% um, are located in kind of jurisdictional or geographically challenging areas uh, and generally along borders that are fairly corrupt and near conflict zones so that they tend to be able to uh, make money off of the conflicts that are going on uh, around them. The one thing that they don't want uh, is to be picked up by the media or the law enforcement. So it's been interesting in looking at these 80 that they have very redundant ways of moving from the black spots. So they generally have some kind of water, some kind of air, some kind of road access. Now they don't have to be our sense of a big beautiful airport or a uh, cruise ship, uh, or even a macadam road. Uh, they can be trails. And I think one of the interesting things about the 80 is that two thirds of them are actually located on the old traditional trading routes that have been used across centuries. So the Silk Road, and then you think about the Balkans route, you think about the route up in to Russia, you think about the trails in the Amazon, you think about the routes across the Sahel and the Sahara, uh, and we're actually kind of going back in time. And one of the criticisms often made of our project is, well, surely most of these came into effect after the fall of the Soviet Union, <laughs> and that it was just these various countries that already had black markets set up in them that made this possible. And literally, it's a 50-50 split. So 50% of our 80, so 40 of them, are, have been there for centuries. And I'm going to point out one of them, which has become very interested, interesting to all of us in thinking about ISIL. If you look at where, from Syria into Iraq, ISIL joins, it's at Abu Kamal which wow. is Abu Kamal, wow. right? Which is the lowest place, the Euphrates River, you can often walk across it. And in effect, the US actually closed Abu Kamal when we invaded Iraq because the foreign fighters were coming through that area. And the captain said as he left, I give them two hours and they'll be back, back in business. And it's interesting that that's the one place that has allowed for the illicit activities from both Syria uh, through Iraq. Uh, we found 
got into this uh, through a young man who actually did a six-month ethnographic study of Ciudad del Este in the triboard area in Latin America. He had a camera he held in the back of his hand, so nobody realized he was taking pictures. He did informal conversations, and he kind of tracked what was being built, what could you buy, and then actually went to the capital of Paraguay and inter interviewed officials in the law enforcement there and learned how difficult it was for them to actually keep Ciudad del Este under control. And part of it is, and John Burdick sitting back over here, part of it is Brazil has such high tax rates on some of the goods that it's easier for people to cross the bridge into Ciudad del Este and walk back with the goods as opposed to paying for them on, on the other side. But he started looking at the governance of Ciudad del Este and began to realize that it was a coordinated effort among a set of transnational criminal organizations. Uh, and so we began to think about, could we do what Ezra was talking about? Could we go through the literature on insurgents, terrorists, and transnational criminal organizations on this notion of ungoverned spaces or territories, which has been out in the literature for long periods of time, and then on various ways of trafficking. So minerals, people, drugs, weapons, thinking about what do we know, because most of the time these are all kept separate, and we look at them with separate lenses, separate people studying them. Uh, and we wanted to find out if we could write a manual, use open sources, write detailed kinds of case histories, if we're asking the same questions, then we can begin to compare and contrast across the cases. And so we have very detailed cases on the 80. We update them, so every other year those 80 begin to be updated. Uh, and then we can build a database to compare and contrast uh, across the 80 uh, cases. Uh, we've been interested in a number of things about the 80. So one was their function. If you think about uh, the black spots are a little like multinational corporations to some extent. Uh, they're engaged in economic kinds of activity. Uh, they don't really have to have a state home. They have their own kind of base. They are profit-oriented because they've got to economically support the people in the area. They're providing goods and services, corporate social responsibility for the areas that they actually govern. Uh, and we were interested in what function they play. So 41% are actually producing something or corralling people, uh, but there's some kind of production involved. 57% are distribution kinds of hubs. Uh, all of them tend to engage in transit of some kind. And what we're doing now is building a kind of data mining machine, uh, not a machine, but a program that can actually look at uh, the sources that we can locate that are indigenous to the areas of the black spots and to look for content analyzing for particular kinds of words, phrases, et cetera, so that we be could begin to look at what those flows are. Because these are transactions, so who's going where in, in what way? Um, and it's been fairly easy to identify the black spots. Uh, our first uh, reaction was to ask international students and regional specialists, and they could come up fairly quickly with these various areas uh, in their countries or in their regions. But one of the things we've been interested in doing is can we establish any validity uh, for the black spots? Can we go to and try to see if the things we're picking up in our detailed case studies are actually on the ground. And one of the things that I was telling uh, Phil about is one of the black spots is the Aquasasne Native American Reservation, which is just north of us. 
Uh, and part of it is because it actually <laughs> cuts across two countries. So it's the United States, then we have the St. Lawrence River, and then we have Canada. Cigarettes, drugs, people, all coming through that area. And several of our students have kind of begun to map what is happening in that area. Uh, in thinking about uh, the Balkans route, have a CNN producer who had done a lot in the Balkans and he was getting a master's here. So he actually walked, <laughs> walked, that's not, he, he cabbed the uh, Balkans route going to the black spots that we had identified and came away uh, a number of experiences with young policemen who were under the age of 30 whom he interviewed and their comment was that in effect, uh, within the next years, we would like to start a family. And if we want to start a family, we're going to have to move to working with the drug cartels uh, in the area because we can't afford a family on the salaries we're being paid by the police. And in a, it suggests this weaving together of the governance structures uh, in these areas. Uh, two more minutes, okay. Uh, the other thing, and this is an interest of mine because I'm interested in leadership, is who are, the, what are the groups that are actually governing these spaces? And in effect, 41% are insurgent kinds of groups. So they are groups which are being divided or uh, like the Kurds have no real country, uh, so they, in effect, are governing and often having to being forced to use illicit kinds of activities in order to keep the people alive in those settings. The terrorist organizations, Al-Shabaab and Kismayo uh, in Somalia, uh, and the transnational criminal organizations, the Sinaloa cartel in the Sinaloa state in Mexico. Uh, and one of our interesting findings is that uh, there is an overlap of transnational criminal organizations with terrorist organizations, and so that the criminals are actually providing a lot of the economic uh, success for the terrorist organizations. And in those cases, the terrorist activities are diminished by 25%. Now, we're trying to say, do we say to law enforcement, put transnational criminal organizations in with your terrorist organizations. But it is interesting that uh, there may be a change in focus. The other thing is, how are these financed? And we've begun looking into kinds of money laundering. Uh, so do you use shell uh, front companies? Uh, how do you organize uh, to translate, transfer the funding that you're getting? All of these black spots are multifunction, so they're all multi-product. They're all doing all of these things because, in effect, as one, it's just like a multinational. As one product diminishes in price, they will figure out another way uh, to earn funding. So one of our cautions is, don't get rid of them completely. And we've had several students to do studies of Plan Columbia which was uh, the U.S. working with the state of Colombia to remove the cocaine production in Colombia. And in effect, you see the movement of that cocaine production to Bolivia, to Peru. So it's not going to end, but what they're finding are these other kinds of areas that are equivalently sovereign and the redundancies that they've built in to the process itself. And much of what's happening in Mexico now is a result, actually, of our plan Colombia. And what the drug cartel said will reduce the uh, sending of cocaine to the United States. And they did, by 40%. But they increased the sending of cocaine to Europe by 60%. So finding different routes to find a market. And it's why I think we have to be very cautious in thinking about. And if you're talking about uh, post-conflict reconstruction and you've got black spots in the areas that you're looking at, they need to be included or it's not going to work out. <laughs>